It was as deadly as it was beautiful. The aircraft of choice for America's ace of aces. It was the best damn airplane ever built. As far as I am concerned, it was like flying a Cadillac automobile. It gained an unparalleled reputation as the most versatile and lethal combat aircraft of its day. It was the Lockheed P-38, nicknamed the Lightning. It was just an aviator's dream to fly in a P-38. It made the war in the Pacific. Designed as a fighter interceptor, it was the P-38 that claimed the scalp of Japan's most celebrated military strategist, Admiral Yamamoto, the mastermind behind the attack on Pearl Harbor. Using color reenactments and archive film, Battle Stations takes to the skies in the fearsome P-38 Lightning. As the Wall Street crash of 1929 plunged the US into the Great Depression, its effects were felt worldwide. Japan, heavily dependent on foreign trade, was severely affected. The resulting economic crisis spawned nationalist groups, and the country focused on relieving its domestic troubles by colonizing her Asian neighbors. As Japan emerged as a key power in the region, rivalry with the United States over commercial and territorial interests grew, bringing the risk of confrontation. Japan's aggressive expansion in the region was spearheaded by its sophisticated mono-wing fighters. America's Air Corps, equipped with obsolete biplanes, needed to modernize, and quickly. In February 1937, the US Army Air Corps issued proposal number X-608, calling for an advanced pursuit interceptor aircraft that would be able to perform at previously unheard of levels. We had very few planes that could keep up with the speed of the German planes or even the Japanese planes, so they needed something that uh, would be able to be competitive. The specification called for a desired speed of 400 miles per hour, 100 miles per hour faster than any other military aeroplane of the day, and able to operate efficiently at altitudes of 20,000 feet or more. It would be armed with a 20 millimeter cannon. It was an ambitious proposal. Six contractors, among them Lockheed, submitted designs. A senior figure of Lockheed's design team was a man who would become a legend. Clarence Kelly Johnson had joined the company in 1933. Recognized as being a precocious talent, Kelly was given free reign to design an aircraft that fitted the specification. Realizing that a single-engine aircraft could not possibly match the performance required, Johnson focused his attention on a twin-engine design. Kelly's initial concepts for the new fighter covered a range of configurations, but he finally decided on a profile with twin booms to accommodate the engines with the pilot and guns in a central nacelle. Superchargers were positioned in booms behind the engines, and the armament was to consist of four machine guns in the nose clustered around a cannon. It's really a beautiful looking machine. Very impressive, couple of big engines, lots of firepower, all of it in the nose, which would be very impressive if you're on the wrong end of it. It was a visionary design. He created something that hadn't even been conceptualized in other areas, and the P-38 was a total radical design. Johnson's work paid off. Lockheed won the contract for an experimental prototype. In June 1937, the prototype designated XP-38 went into production. Despite early problems realizing the futuristic design, the plane was completed in just 18 months. It was a top secret project that was shipped in by parts in trucks and assembled in a hangar. Despite flying for only 35 minutes, the test was considered a huge success. Impressed, the US Army Air Corps decided to go after Howard Hughes' transcontinental speed record 
and Lieutenant Benjamin Kelsey was ordered to fly the prototype from Marchfield, California to Mitchellfield, New York, as fast as he could. The XP-38 smashed the record by 23 minutes. The bad thing was they didn't tell the New York people the plane was coming, and when it got there, they were told to circle and we'll give you permission to land, and ran out of gas and had to belly in on a golf course. Though Kelsey survived the impact, the aircraft did not. Lockheed's prototype XP-38, the only one of its kind, was destroyed, but it had proved its worth. As Europe descended into chaos, the US Army Air Corps ordered 66 P-38s, the first ever 400 mile per hour fighter was officially given the green light. Early in 1939, Britain and France ordered 667 P-38s, but the planes, dubbed lightnings by the British, were to be built without superchargers. Lockheed engineers protested this decision, labeling the variant the castrated P-38. With the fall of France in 1940, Britain took over the whole P-38 order, but their decision to remove the superchargers would have dire consequences. Having taken delivery of just three castrated lightnings, the RAF realized that the plane's performance was severely limited. The British didn't like the airplane. And they'd been in, in, in conflict for quite a while, and they knew airplanes, and they didn't want that thing. And it was a real dog. It didn't have some turbo. It didn't fly high. All the props turned in the same direction. Faced with an inferior fighter, Britain canceled the entire order. From now on, the P-38 would be solely an American fighter. But its entry into service was not a smooth one. As P-38 pilots would soon find out, its problems were just beginning. As America's new P-38s rolled off the production line, serious problems began to emerge. We're not going to try to teach you how to fly. You've all had good training in other ships. We're simply going to show you how we handle a 38. One danger was compressibility, causing the controls to lock up in a high-speed dive, leaving the pilot no option but to bail out. The P-38 was uh, having a problem, a uh, credibility problem. Pilots are, are aspiring pilots and heard some things that uh, weren't very complimentary about the P-38. Now, as young cadets, 20, 21 years old, we really didn't know what compressibility was at the time, but that was one of the rumors that the P-38 was a dangerous airplane if it hit compressibility. But the most dangerous problem by far was the tendency of the aircraft in the event of a single engine failure on takeoff to flip over and slam upside down into the runway. Most people were not used to flying anything faster than about 200 miles an hour. So here you suddenly have a 400 plus mile an hour aircraft with very strong engines. So if you lose an engine, most people who were flying in the early days would panic and they'd roll over and just go right in. Modifications to the P-38s followed. The plane's Allison engines underwent a structural redesign and outward turning props were added to reduce the effects of torque these modifications would make the plane more stable during flight. And in an effort to combat the P-38's image problems, Tony Levere, Lockheed's chief test pilot, was drafted in to help. They had some bad rumors out about, about the aircraft uh, wasn't a safe airplane to fly and so forth. And Tony came by and gave us a demonstration of the P-38. I saw him fly uh, on single engine and do slow rolls, do everything that you'd want to do with a single engine aircraft, and he did it on one engine and had one dead. And uh, 
I think that was a real selling factor as far as I was concerned. During the spring of 1941, the credibility of the P-38 was slowly being restored. But Kelly's fighter, like the United States, was not yet ready for war. But on the morning of December the 7th, 1941, everything changed. In the days following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese, guided by Admiral Yamamoto, scored a series of crushing victories in the Pacific. The Pacific fleet had been all but destroyed, and MacArthur's army in the Philippines began its ill-fated retreat. By capturing Wake Island, Dutch New Guinea, and the strategic port of Rabul, Japan gained the upper hand across the Pacific. Reeling from this series of body blows, America prepared to send its aircraft to war. In accordance with the Allied Europe First strategy, the US sent its older P-39s to the Pacific and its new P-38s to Britain. We who went to the Southwest Pacific, any place in the Pacific, uh, we were just sent there more or less as a holding detail to try to stem the flow and hold on to what we had and uh, keep the Japs from capturing any more. But the Lightning's performance in Europe fell short of expectations. Operating at altitudes of around 15,000 feet, far lower than it had been designed for, the large twin-engined Lightning proved to be considerably less maneuverable than smaller Axis aircraft like the ME-109. But the P-38's devastating firepower often compensated for its lack of maneuverability at low altitude. Now the US Air Force looked for a high altitude role for its P-38s in Europe. They soon found one. 99 P-38s were modified for photo reconnaissance missions. One of the main things you need is stability and if your camera is wobbling, you're not gonna get a good picture and the P-38 was so smooth and quiet, there was no drift caused by the torque of the propellers. And because it was such a stable aircraft, you could get more accurate maps. But flown without fighter escort, these missions could be extremely dangerous. We had cameras instead of guns, but, but we also didn't have as much armor plating on our planes. The theory was to cut down the weight to increase our speed, so we were probably close to 2,000 pounds lighter than the fighter version of the same aircraft. We lost uh, a lot of guys. We had a 70% uh, casualty rate, uh, but nobody ever considered we were doing anything brave because you're only taking pictures out there. But on the other side of the world, P-38s would face even greater dangers. In the desperate days of early 1942, one aircraft dominated the skies of the Pacific. The performance of the Mitsubishi A6M-0 in every major battle of the war to date confirmed its superiority as a fighter. American airmen flying P-39s and P-40s were powerless to stop them. The Air Force considered the P-39 as our number one fighter until they had to use it in combat and they found out then that it was not the aircraft for the job. If I had been jumped by Zeros, and a P-39 back in those days, the chances are I wouldn't be here talking to you. <laughs> That's about the way we all felt about it. We had good pilots, but they just did not have the equipment. I wanted to be in an organization that did have the equipment, in this case the P-38, so that our pilots had a fighting chance. A new fighter group consisting entirely of P-38s was established. Now American airmen in the Pacific had the equipment they so badly needed to settle old scores. Big thing is, our country was fighting for its life. Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, they were a hemi-demi semi-quaver away from attacking our homeland. Our country was being threatened. 
What choice did you have? Even though Lockheed's P-38 Lightnings were being produced in greater numbers, precious few were deployed to the Southwest Pacific. Despite this disadvantage, the P-38 would play a key role in one of the most crucial missions of the war. After Japan's crushing defeats at Midway and Guadalcanal, Admiral Yamamoto, the strategic mastermind behind the infamous attack at Pearl Harbor, planned a tour of frontline bases to restore flagging morale. On April the 13th, 1943, American codebreakers intercepted a message which included explicit details of Yamamoto's schedule. A plan to intercept was devised. We had broken the Japanese code and knew that Yamamoto was going to make this trip to one of his outposts, and he, they knew his habits was, were very punctual, and that's how they were able to put this mission together. At 8 a.m. on the morning of April the 18th, a flight of P-38s from the 339th Fighter Squadron took to the skies. They sent 16 P-38s, 12 of them would be top cover, and four of the P-38s would be the attack group. They would go down after the Betty bomber that Yamamoto was supposed to be in, and the other 12 airplanes would chase off any Japanese fighters. Just one and a half hours later, the Americans spotted Yamamoto's flight of two Bettys and six Zeros. Four of the P-38s pounced, and in the ensuing battle, both Bettys were hit, and Yamamoto's aircraft plunged into the jungle below. America's lightnings had come out fighting, but there was still a long way to go. Now it would face its toughest test yet, against the battle-hardened Japanese pilots in the skies of the Southwest Pacific. With the death of Japan's leading admiral, America launched an all-out offensive against Japanese air power in the South Pacific. The enemy's advance had been halted, now the United States Army Air Force would fight back. From bases on the eastern coast of New Guinea, they would attack the fearsome aerodromes of Wewak and Rabaul. The swiftest and most effective means of gaining control of the air was to bomb Japanese airfields, to destroy as many planes on the ground as possible. Such daylight strikes could only be accomplished with a fighter escort, and the only plane in the Allied arsenal with the range to escort the bombers was the P-38. For many of the pilots of the newly established 475th Fighter Group in New Guinea, it would be their first taste of combat. This was kind of stupid, but uh, at that age, we were actually looking forward to getting into combat and uh, utilizing the training that we had been working on for some time. Intelligence photos provided by P-38 reconnaissance aircraft pinpointed the targets. We had a Fifth Air Force uh, a briefing where the command would get up and brief the desires and give us a plan, and it was to send the B-25s in low with P-38 cover and to destroy the targets. We flew a long distance over water before we hit a target. We were probably 200 miles away from a target before we climbed to altitude, whatever our bombing altitude was. We would pick up the fighters along the way. They would S-turn in front of us before we got to the target. Typically, the Japanese Zeros would hit you before you got to your target. You may see 50, 100 fighters swarming up from below in every direction. You know, they're, they're all climbing, they're headed for the bombers. That's what they want. They got to keep those bombers out of there. And of course, our job is to get in there and swarm with them and keep them off the bombers. And that's about what it looks like if you've ever seen a person uh, getting hit by a swarm of bees. That is what it looks like when you get in combat because you've got airplanes coming in from every direction, your own, yours, enemies, everybody. 
anybody that's had been in aerial combat and says, well, it doesn't bother them and they're not afraid are first class liars. All the time you're in a fight, you're so full of adrenaline, you didn't know who you were because you're so concentrated in that cockpit and what's going on all the time and your head's on a swivel for fear someone's gonna get you. It reminded me of being chased around the block by someone with a gun in his hand. You're really not you're really interested at all. It's what caliber that damn gun is. You're just running around that block just trying to get away, and that's about the way combat was. As the P-38s tangled with the fighters, the bombers leveled out on their bomb runs. When you're flying in formation over a target, you can't vary because you had six planes in a formation, three in one formation and three lower. You had to keep in your formation before you dropped your bombs. So you couldn't veer off to the right or the left as you saw these bullets coming. So you had to fly and watch these tracers hitting towards your plane. Flying at low level, the B-25s dropped parafragmentation bombs, each capable of tearing aircraft and personnel to pieces. The B-24's thousand pound bombs destroyed the runways, depriving the Japanese of any opportunity to fly in replacements. But it wasn't just the bombers who did the damage. As you're out there, everybody's yelling at you, Jake, that's mine. Each guy was trying to pick off a plane of his own. And I got behind one. The first time I fired those guns, it just about blew that plane right off the map of the world. It just ex practically exploded as it went over the top of me. Parts were flying all over the place. When the P-38s would fire all their machine guns, they hit a Japanese zero, the zero generally blew up in flames. That was the end of it. I was just amazed. It just, it just tore holes all the way up there, and when it hit the wing, the wings blew off, the engine and all. And of course, he rolled over and went in. That was close enough that I, I realized that that 20 millimeter in that nose was so destructive. Throughout August 1943, pilots of the 475th Fighter Group flew hundreds of sorties to Weewak, destroying 41 enemy aircraft for the loss of only three Lightnings. The bombing campaign in the South Pacific allowed the invasion forces to capture enemy positions without fear of aerial attacks. As the Japanese retreated, the US Army Air Force advanced, occupying the bases that they had so mercilessly bombed. It might take them uh, three or four days to get it cleaned out an area to where we could get in after we'd blown everything to pieces. The engineers went in and, and laid down a runway that we could use. They'd go in there and have a base cleaned out and a strip put in and in, in a couple of weeks. It was unreal. There was a bulldozing off of aircraft that were laying all over the place. And when we went into Alandia, man, there were piles 50 feet high of Japanese aircraft that they just bulldozed into a pile. Everything was destroyed. Of course, we lived in tents. Everything was a tent. I mean, the mess hall was a tent. Your quarters were a tent. Your ops office was a tent. Everything was rolled up and packed. Despite the difficult conditions, there was no respite for the pilots. Operating from these forward bases, the P-38 squadrons were in the vanguard of the advance in the Pacific. Even with the experience of the pilots, Combat missions over enemy-held territory carried with them enormous risks. You've got to be off your rocker to want to be a fighter pilot because it's like these little dodgem cars you see in these carnivals all where people are chasing around these dodgems and they're bumping into each other. Only visualize yourself sitting on top of a 55-gallon drum of gasoline chasing it around in, like dodgems and firing incendiary bullets at each other, imagining what's going to happen. You've got to be nuts. There's two things a fighter pilot dreads the most. Losing an engine on takeoff, when you got a full load, maybe carrying a couple of 1,000-pound bombs. And the other one is every pilot's nightmare is a mid-air collision. 
I just happen to look off to my left, and my God, here's a P-38 staring me in the face, right there, staring me in the face. So I just shoved everything forward. As I did, I got hit. It was like being hit by a Mack truck. And the plane started flipping all over the sky, doing all kind of crazy stuff. So the first thing, of course, I try to do is get out of this airplane. I've got the windows rolled down. I'm going to get out. Now I forgot I got the oxygen mask on. I still got the earphones hooked on. And the meantime, the plane is flopping around, not doing too well. We were always told, don't jump out. Because if we do, and that stabilizer, horizontal stabilizer back there hits you, it'll break your neck or break your back, and you're dead. So the objective was to try to get out on a wing and slide down a wing so you'd slide underneath that stabilizer. So I finally worked my way down, get onto the wing. Down I went, pulled the ripcord, and bingo, opens the chute. It no sooner open, than here come two Jap fighters after me. They're coming in, strafing. Tracer goes right by. Why they didn't hit me, I don't know. And the two of them went right on by me. I got to reach out and grab them. And I thought, this is no good. This is ridiculous to stand here. That's a terrible feeling to hang in a chute and see somebody like that coming in. So I climbed the shroud lines to dump the chute, which I did. I dumped it. Got the hell out of there. Down I go. Next thing I know, I'm almost on top of the tree, so I let go of the chute again, and thank God it opened. Boom. She opened up again, and just as she opened up, I hit the trees. I remember just trying to kick my legs up underneath me. Just as I did, I hit the ground and busted the right knee, which wasn't too swift. I was behind Jap lines, and I thought, oh boy, I could hear the fighting going on. Fighting against the Japanese in the South Pacific, if you went down, your chances of, of returning to base was almost nil. They just didn't, they just didn't get back over there. Defying the odds, Lieutenant Jake Jekyll survived, and after 10 days in the jungle behind enemy lines, was eventually picked up by a Navy PBY Catalina. By late summer 1943, the US had turned its attention to the mighty Japanese stronghold at Rabaul. Once again, the P-38s were called in to escort the bombers around the clock. We knew that the Japs had a huge base at Rabaul, and they used that base to either hit the Solomons or come down to hit New Guinea. And it was their Pearl Harbor, actually, of the South. If we could knock out Rabaul, why? It'd be a, a big step forward. For several months, the battle to level Rabaul raged, earning the pilots of the 475th 62 enemy kills. The growing success of the Lightning and its pilots was making headlines. Among those taking notice was the famous aviator Charles A. Lindbergh. His interest in the aircraft would soon have an unexpected impact on its performance and on the war in the Pacific. The P-38's formidable drive up through New Guinea had attracted the attention of America's lone eagle, Charles Augustus Lindbergh. In 1927, Lindbergh's solo transatlantic flight had delighted the world. Only months before America entered the war, the famous aviator, a firm isolationist, had resigned his colonelcy in the Army Air Corps Reserve. Now, eager to fly, Lindbergh had sought reinstatement but Roosevelt's administration had refused. In June 1944, without the knowledge of the White House, Lindbergh visited the 475th Fighter Group. He was curious to find out more about America's only twin-engine fighter, an aircraft he had never flown. He was a consultant to design a twin-engine fighter for the Navy. And he was always asking questions. What do you like about a twin-engine fighter? What kind of armament do you like? You know, uh, what range do you think it of? What kind of combat ability? He wanted to know all the answers. Almost immediately, Lindbergh discovered a crucial variable that would affect the performance of the P-38. Flying at the very limits of their range, the P-38s needed to be airborne and in formation as quickly as possible. 
With very small margins for error, wasted fuel could claim lives. We poured the coal on and started taking off on this mission, and I get almost all the way around. I look down there, and there's an airplane on the runway blocking everybody. Blocking the runway forced the planes already in the air to circle overhead for several minutes, wasting precious fuel. And we were coming back in from that mission, and most of us were sucking air from the bottom of our tanks as we came in and landing with very damn little fuel left. We had a guy run out of fuel on the taxi ramp, and I'm really upset. And not being very smart, I hadn't checked on the, my little roster to see who it was. I just said, OK, who's a blankety blank? You know that parked his aircraft on the runway. And uh, Mr. Lindbergh stood up, and I about passed out. I could have, if I could have gone through the floor, I would have. Despite his embarrassment, Major Warren Lewis made his point. Fuel was not to be wasted. About two days later, he come up to the tent and he says, uh, Major Lewis, he says, can I come in and talk with you? And I said, sure, come on in. And he said, I've figured out a way to save more fuel for you. Because of his transatlantic experience, Lindbergh was no stranger to issues of fuel economy. He persuaded the group's CEO, Charles McDonald, to let him address the pilots. We met in a large tent with all the pilots and all our crew chief, the ground crew, everybody was there. And Colonel Mack first talked to us, and then Lindbergh spoke to us and told us just bluntly, this is what he was going to have us do to increase our range. And he said, we checked the tech order, and we can cut the uh, RPM down to 1,400 RPM and use 30 inches of mercury and probably save uh, maybe 50 to 100 gallons of fuel on a mission. Of course, when our crew chiefs and all our line chiefs all heard this, they thought, ah, oh, come on, it'll wreck the engine. It says burn the engines out. This is a dumb thing to do. But how are you going to tell a man like Lindbergh what's dumb, what you think? If you, who are you? You're this big compared to, to Lindbergh. But nevertheless, that's the way it came out, and that's what happened. There were some really bitter questions towards Lindbergh, questioning uh, his theories. And uh, Lindbergh finally shut everybody up by saying, boys, I am willing to fly with you under the conditions which I have outlined. And it was as simple as that. You can't uh, fault somebody that uh, is, is willing to go on the mission. He's not telling you what to do and then won't go with you. He was willing to prove the theories along with us. Lindbergh was assigned a P-38 in which to test his theory. And he only flew that thing, and he flew it in some mannerism that he was able to pull it back and do this and get much better uh, mileage, if you want to call it, that we were getting. And after the two weeks or so, they hit, tore the engines apart, and amazed, not a damn thing wrong with them. We did it on the next mission, and some guys had as much as 80 gallons more landing than we ever had. So uh, that's the kind of a man that Mr. Lindbergh was. He was always looking for ways to do things better and to make it easier for those that flew. In just a few months, the 475th's famous guest had single-handedly increased the range of the Lightning, opening up new targets. Before, the P-38s had been limited to a 900-mile round journey. Now, they could fly a staggering 1,800 miles. We were good for six to six and a half hours was our average range prior to Lindbergh coming over. And after he had spent the three or four months with us, our range was anywhere from 12 to 14 hours if we had to go that long. Lindbergh, a civilian observer, had already taught the P-38 pilots how to double their range, but he was hungry for combat. In July, he got his chance. Flying unauthorized on a patrol with the 475th, he shot down an enemy aircraft. Lindbergh had his kill, but in so doing, had broken his strict observer status. Fearful that the high-profile civilian would be killed in combat, a public relations disaster, the government immediately recalled him. Lindbergh's war was over. 
but his contribution was not. On October the 14th, 1944, P-38s from the 475th flew an astonishing 1,800 miles to attack Balik Papan in Borneo, the hub of Japan's oil production in the Pacific. The long-range attack, made possible by Limburg settings, stunned the Japanese, tipping the balance of power like nothing before. If I had to name one person who contributed more to the war in the Pacific, I can honestly say it was Charles Lindbergh, a civilian, because he showed our pilots how to shift the aircraft into overdrive, so to speak. Now the P-38, with its unrivaled range, prepared for the final assault on the Philippines. From September 1944 onwards, the American advance in the Philippines focused on the very heart of Japanese air power in the region. P-38s, using settings outlined by Lindbergh, had become the first long-range fighters to penetrate Philippine airspace since the US withdrawal in 1942. Now they would be deployed against Leyte. Leyte was to be the anvil, wrote MacArthur, against which I hope to hammer the Japanese into submission. Having fought their way up through New Guinea, the P-38 pilots have become one of the most skilled fighting units of the war. The Zero gained a wonderful reputation at the beginning of the war. And that was partly our fault uh, because we were using uh, World War I tactics. In other words, we were dogfighting. The idea of the so-called dogfight stuff that went on in World War I of one plane against the other plane was a no-no as far as we were concerned. And the fellows that broke out of the squadron after a Jap plane all by himself, usually he caught royal hell when he, we got back on the ground again because that was not the idea. It was important that everybody knew that you weren't out to run up your own score. You were out there to work as a team. And that's one of the things one of the big reasons, in my judgment, in addition to superior equipment that we had over the Japanese was our tactics. We tried to maintain 300 miles an hour and never uh, uh, tried to climb or turn with the Jap airplane because they get out climbing, out turning. And, and so you just you went away from them and then turned around and come back and took another shot. And that, <laughs> that discouraged the hell out of them. You have a very high airspeed. You made passes at them, and they were always the hunted, and we were the hunters. In the Philippines, Major Thomas B. Maguire scored the group's first kill of the campaign, his 25th of the war, making him the leading ace of the group. He was such a great shot. He didn't need a gun sight. He just aimed the airplane and shot people down. And he was probably the best in my estimation, the best pilot that ever flew a P-38. Tommy was driven by a fierce, aggressive, strong attitude toward being a world's greatest fighter pilot. And he was going to make it no matter how he did it. And uh, he was a great fighter pilot. This guy could shoot. But leading the charge in the Philippines was the group's CO, Major Charles McDonald. Every time we had the, the toughest mission coming up, our first mission said to Rabal, who led us was Colonel Mack. He wasn't a desk operator sitting back and saying, you guys do this, you guys take that machine gun desk and that kind of stuff. Colonel Mack led us. When we first went into WEWAC, Colonel Mack led us. When we first went back, the first missions we made to Philippines all the way from New Guinea. Who led us? Colonel Mack led us. Well, he was a terrific leader. That was one of his attributes. He was a great planner, and he was a great fighter pilot. Some people are just natural hunters, you know? And these were hunters of aircraft. In the autumn of 1944, the U.S. Marines stormed ashore at Leyte. As almost 20,000 U.S. troops from the 6th Army toughed it out to take and secure the heavily defended island airstrips, P-38s played a key role strafing troop barges in support of the ground operations. The 
In the Philippines, the P-38 would claim more than 200 kills, bringing its total to approximately 550. With the help of the P-38, US forces had systematically halted and then reversed the Japanese advance in the South Pacific. We were at it every damn day, keeping the Japs from going into Australia, chasing them from Rabaul back and back and back and back and into the Philippines. It was the Army Air Corps that was at it all the time. Without the P-38, I don't think we'd have been as lucky to, to push the Japs back as fast as we did. In fact, it's probably surprising to all, including General MacArthur, of how well the 38 cleaned the clock of the Japanese over there. On December the 25th, 1944, MacArthur fulfilled his promise and returned to the Philippines. The P-38 had proved its worth in the Pacific. America's ace of aces, the highest scoring army ace of the war with 40 kills to his name, was Dick Bong, a P-38 pilot. Tommy McGuire with 38 confirmed kills was second, and Major Charles McDonald with 27 ensured that the P-38 would have its place in history as the most deadly fighter of the war. As final preparations were made for the invasion of the Japanese home islands, the P-38s remained at the heart of the Allied stranglehold on Japan herself. But in August, the US Army Air Force dropped its atomic bombs. Now, P-38 reconnaissance planes bore witness to the total destruction of the enemy. We were up at about 18,000 feet, and we could see it for probably eight, 10 miles before we got there. And it was very interesting, because we had done a lot of bomb damage assessment, where normally you can tell the type of bombs that were used. It was sort of like, Wow, that must have been one hell of a bomb. And it, it, it was something that left enough of an impact that it's forever burned in my memory. The awesome power unleashed by the US had ended Japan's resistance. World War II was over. During its four years of combat, the lightning had grown from an undesirable contender into a reliable champion. In just two years, no less than 41 P-38 aces had been created, and the aircraft itself had destroyed more Japanese planes than any other US fighter. I think the 38 was responsible for winning the war in the Pacific, almost. I mean, that's, you know, a big statement, but it had an awful lot to do with it. Not only was it a good fighter, it was a good dive bomber, and they also had the F-4 and the F-5, which were the photo versions. It was a wonderful aircraft. As I like to say, save my butt down there in the World War II. The three leading aces in, in the theater flew P-38s, and I feel strongly that the P-38, the good Lord put that airplane over there, it was perfect for that mission. We're talking about flying over water and flying over jungle and what happens to you when you go down. Well, I went down once. 
It was on December the 18th, 1943, a very dismal day for me. And aha, I spot a Jap going by, and I'm peeling in behind him, and I think, I'm gonna get this character. He's, he's got goner. And as I look back to see if my guys are there, Pete and all of them, they're all back there. And I just happen to look off to my left, and my God, here's a P-38 staring me in the face, right there, staring me in the face. So I just shoved everything forward. As I did, I got hit. It was like being hit by a Mack truck. Out I went, pulled the ripcord, and bingo, opens the chute. This is a chute I thought I'd carried with me from Tallahassee, Florida, when we were first assigned the chute, brought it with us overseas, carried it in different squatters, took your chute with you, it was like your buddy. When this thing opened, it says U.S. Navy. Now, where the hell that U.S. Navy chute came from, I do not know, but that's what it said. It no sooner opened than here come two Jap fighters after me. They're in formation, the two of them. They're coming in, the strafing tracer goes right by. Why they didn't hit me, I don't know. And the two of them went right on by me. I got to reach out and grab them. And I thought, this is no good. This is ridiculous to stand here. That's a terrible feeling to hang in a chute and seeing somebody like that coming in. So I climbed the shroud lines to dump the chute, which I did. I dumped it, got the hell out of there but I didn't pay attention to where I was. And by the way, when I got out of that plane, I remember glancing at the altimeter, and I can't to this day know whether I jumped at 19,000 or 9,000. I don't know what the altitude was. However, when I hang on to the shroud lines and all the chute, down I go. Next thing I know, I'm almost on top of the tree, so I let go of the chute again, and thank God it opened. Boom. She opened up again, and just as she opened up, I hit the trees. And again, Thank goodness I didn't hit in the center of a tree. I hit where I went through the branches and all the tree. And those trees over there in those jungle rainforests have lots of foliage up in the top. But after you go through that initial foliage, you're, you got a drop of about 100 feet, 150 feet to the ground. So I went right through, and the chute didn't snag or anything. I went right on straight through, but I was falling face forward into the ground. I remember just trying to kick my legs up underneath me. Just as I did, I hit the ground, and busted the right knee, which wasn't too swift. So from then on, for the next, I was in there for 10 days. I, they calculated that I must have been in about 50 miles inland from the ocean. And when I landed and got straightened around and I tore some chute out of the, some silk out of the chute, stuffed it in my pocket and all, took the jungle pack, we carried a chute, we had a jungle pack in our chute in which we had medicine, machete, gloves, and without machete, gloves, and a compass, I'd still be there somewhere. And I remember taking a bit of the shroud line and tied it around my neck, and the compass was like a little watch thing, tied it so that I'd have the compass with me, it wouldn't lose the compass. And then I started to walk away after I tried to cover up the chute with leaves and stuff to so-called bury it. I was behind Jap lines, and I thought, oh boy, I could hear the fighting going on. And uh, I started down a stream. I thought, I'll walk down this little stream. That'll throw them of where I am. As soon as I start walking down the stream, I see all this yellow stuff. Well, we carry these yellow tablets in these damn parachutes that if we went down the ocean, we could break these things. And it, so that yellow stuff wasn't such a smart idea. I somehow covered that all up again and continued on. That night, that first night, I remember I was in water probably up to my knees. I was in a sago swamp. And uh, I cut down all kind of branches and all to make a big fat bed that I could lie on. You have never seen mosquitoes until you've lived in New Guinea <laughs> or New Britain. I was in New Britain. Now I'm, a, I'm 150 miles away from Dobadura where we took off over into New Britain. And the question is, how is he ever going to get home? Well, to make a, a long story short, and I've got to, or we'll be here all day long, it took me 10 days to finally, before I was picked up. And during that 10 days, I chopped my way through many areas of that jungle without gloves and a machete and that compass that had never made it. I, you'd start through, and you'd look at the compass headed, and I knew where I had to go. I had made up my mind, incidentally, that I wasn't going to Rabaul that way, which was the recommended way to go back that way, because allegedly, there would be Aussie scouts, or maybe natives would help you, and occasionally they had guys go that way, and they picked them up at night. 
in a submarine and brought them back at night. And I thought, no, no, I'm not going to do that because I knew, I had known that the Marines were going to land on Christmas Day at Cape Gloucester. And this is the 18th of December. So I thought, the hell with that noise. I'll work my way toward Gloucester behind the Jap lines. And when I get up there and the fighting is all, I'll bury myself in some way. And when the Marines push the Japs by, I'll come back up again. This is my thinking. And that's the way I was headed. I remember one day I tried to get across a river. And I had a balsa log about 18 inches in diameter and so long. It was my buddy I was using to walk along the river. I'm mowing water up the so deep. Still just got out of the Sago swamps and all. I tried to swim across the little creek once to get the shoreline, but I had these Aussie flying boots on. And once again, the Lord was good to me because most guys that wore Aussie flying boots, their fur-lined boots, when they jumped, and that sh sh the chute snapped, caught, the boots kept going. So you ended up in the jungle with no shoes at all. But thank God mine stayed on. But I tried to swim with them on, and they're soaking wet and full of water and stuff. It didn't work. I damn near drowned trying to swim, so I gave that up. But I had to get across this broad river, and I, to this day, don't know the name of that river, but I spent all day long a straddle this big, well, slog, paddling across this river, hoping the Japs going by wouldn't spot me, because occasionally Japs go by in a boat, or Japanese planes in the air, if they spotted me, I was a goner, or maybe crocodiles. I had no idea. But again, you're young, you're dumb, and nothing can happen to you. So onward you go. I never thought... I had also, when I left the chute, I had two chocolate bars that I kept, and I had it wrapped up in some more of this shroud, I mean, parachute stuff, and tucked into one of these pant pockets in the flying suit. But after I was out a day, that first night I had two, two little chocolate chunks. The next day, something happened where I fell off of a cliff. Now, how do you fall off of a cliff when you're in a swamp? I don't know, but I did. And when I fell off the cliff, I lost this stuff that I had all the medicine in, this piece of the parachute and the chocolate bars, and I couldn't find it. It was gone. So from then on, I'm on my own. In the meantime, since I was back in this far, I had decided that I better save water, knowing I was going to head for the ocean. So I had chopped holes in the, in the May West, front and back, the two layers, and filled it with water back there before it was all brackish and salty. So I had a water supply, which was another reason I couldn't swim without a Mae West. The Mae West was useless for that purpose. Anyway, I made it across this river and started down toward the ocean. All kind of things happened while I was in there. I tried fishing. That was a waste of time. We had a little fishing kit in this so-called jungle pack. I also tried shooting fish with a 45. That's a waste of time, too. In fact, that 45 is a better weapon if you throw it at somebody than if you shoot somebody with it. Because I tried to shoot parrots. No way. I'd wedge it into trees and aim at a parrot. After a while, the gun was so wet from being in a swamp and all the time, every time I fired it, everything was locked up in the back, and I have to sit down and take that damn gun apart, sitting in the jungle. Oh, another thing comes up. That first night in the jungle, sitting on top of my bed, Mosquitoes, oh my God. I still had my helmet, but I had taken the earphones out so the mosquitoes are coming in this way. So I put leaves and stuff in here to keep the mosquitoes from getting into biting me. I took a piece of that parachute and put it over the top of my head. Then I put the helmet on, tucked the chute in around my flying suit, had the gloves on, these slits in this flying suit pockets. I had my arms down there to try to keep them out. Billions of them. In fact, for quite a few years after that, I had scars from here to here. I was red from mosquito bites. It was just raw from mosquito bites from the 10 days in there. So anyway, we're back to where we just crossed the river, worked the way way down. And the next day, now I'm in mangrove swamps. Mangroves are terrible to walk in. Those things, if you've ever seen a mangrove swamp, the stuff grows up and all over the place and trying to walk with a knee that's no good. Many times that he'd really go out of joint and I'd have to sit down on the ground and get up against a coconut tree and with 
get my leg up, put up against the cross, and with my other foot hold onto it, to push it against the tree, and grab my leg, and like so, to pull it back into joint, snap it back into joint. Nobody's feeling sorry for you when all this happens. You're on your own. You're not putting on an act for anybody. I also made a promise to myself, don't talk. Because somebody told me once that when you're alone like that, if you start talking, you'll drive yourself crazy. So I never said a word. All this time I was in there, I never said a word to myself or anything. About one day after I made it across the river, and I'm paddling along outside of the mangrove swamp, hanging over into the ocean. Now I'm back at the ocean front. Uh, I go into a little cove, and there's a the little dock in there, and there's an outrigger wired to the dock with a copper wire. You knew damn well the Japanese had done it. In fact, I knew it because the Japs would go by, and when I was on my log, I'd have to hide underneath the mangroves stuff while the Japs went by, and I'd come back out again and blah, blah, blah. So I took the outrigger, and I started paddling it around. I had a long stick as my paddle, and said goodbye to my balsa buddy, and uh, carried on along, the, headed down to our Gloucester. That first night, I slept on the, the flat spot on this outrigger, and the first time I didn't have to sleep in the trees. I'd been sleeping in the trees or in the swamp. However, the next morning I hear noise, and I think, oh my God, it's those B-25 strafers. These guys came down the shorelines every day, I'm just about dawn every day when we were over there. They shot up anything that was in the front, in anything. Sugar Charlies, native boats, anything else, just blast them all. These B-25s had anywhere from eight to 12 50s mounted on the front wings and cannons and everything else. And I thought, they're gonna get me. <laughs> what am I gonna do? And I heard them coming and coming and coming. And just as they came closer, I knew I was gonna be in trouble. I dove off of that outrigger and made myself swim down as deep, as deep, deep as I could possibly swim. And I heard them going on. I could hear the goddamn bullets stuff hitting the water and all. It sounded like hell, wild. And finally I came back up again. They were gone, and they had shot the whole deck and everything off of this outrigger. Good thing I did what I did, and I carried on. And one more day comes up, and uh, I think to myself, by, the now, by now I've run out of water. And I've been, in fact, rinsing my, water, my mouth out of salt water for about a day or two. I thought, today, if I don't get picked up, I've got to go back inside. I've got to get something to eat, and I've got to get water. I thought, I've got to get off this thing and go back into the jungle again if I don't pick, get picked up today. And while I'm thinking this way, I hear a plane coming up behind me. I think, oh, my God. So I, once again, trying to shove this outrigger underneath the mangrove and all that. I said, wait, that's not a Jap plane. And I look back and it's a Catalina flying boat. And these guys, as they approached, I'm, I'd taken all my clothes off because I was been soaking wet for days. I looked like a big chunk of cottage cheese is what it looked like. So I'm out there trying to get dry. And I got my flying suit off, and the Mae West is off and all that kind of stuff. And when they fly over and these guys in the Catalina are waving at me out the blisters, those big glass blisters I had on them. They're waving at me, and I grabbed the Mae West and shook it at them, thinking they'll know it's a pilot with a damn, they won't think I'm a native. So the plane, I see the plane go on and on and on, off in the distance, and it turns inland. I thought, fine, they're gonna come and get me. So I start paddling away from shore with a stick, you know, paddle, 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 you know, thinking they're gonna land out there and pick me up. I get out so far, and I can't see them. I don't hear them anymore. And I think, wait a minute, there's an offshore wind and it starts to move me offshore. And I thought, this is no good if I end up on the ocean. So I paddle again, I'm paddling back, madly paddling back to get back to shore. And just about the time I get back to shore, I hear engines again. And I look around and here's this Catalina. It had landed out there somewhere and it's taxiing toward me. And they got a guy standing on each wingtip, directing the pilot through the coral reefs so that he doesn't crack up the cat coming through the car way. So once again, I turn around and paddle, 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 out I go, and they get me. 